So we now have one, actually two, different good ideas for how to avoid the local to global heartbreak. Remember, this is the heartbreak where we have an infinite collection of true statements quantified on uh, open sets, right? an open cover of our set of interest, and yet that those infinite collection of truths do not glue together into a single truth on the set which is being covered. So our prototypical example was that the function f of x equals 1 over x is bounded on each one of these open intervals, which together their union blankets the open interval from 0 to 1, and yet, my function is not a bounded function on the open interval from 0 to 1, which is being covered. So we have two ideas for how to get around this phenomenon. The first is called cover finiteness. We want to look for sets which never require us to use infinitely many open sets to cover them. Even if you give me infinitely many open sets to cover my set, I don't need infinitely many. I can pull out a finite subcollection that can do the same job. We call those the cover finite, or CF, sets. The other idea was an idea based around sequences. Subsequentially complete sets, or SC sets, are those where every sequence of points from my set, even if it's not convergent, it has a subsequence which is convergent, and moreover, that the limit of that subsequence is still a point of my set. So every sequence of points from my set has a subsequence which converges to a point in my set. These are two ideas, but we have no reason to believe that these ideas have anything to do with one another nor anything really to do with the local to global heartbreak that we're trying to avoid. So in this video, we have to figure out what cover finiteness and subsequent completeness have to do with each other. Are they different concepts? And if they are different, then in what sense? Or are they the same thing? And if they're the same thing, what does that mean? So this is the video where we get to use these questions to motivate a definition for what it means for a set to be compact. Compact sets are going to be those sets where we can be assured the local to global heartbreak will never happen to us. That if I have an, even an infinite collection of truths on a compact set, that will always glue together into a truth for the entire set. So it's never going to break our hearts. For that reason, compact sets are our best friends, not just this week, but for the whole rest of the course, anything else that we do with analysis and often topology, Compact sets are so nice to work with because we can be assured that any infinite collection of truths is going to glue together into a single global truth. So let's take a look at how these two notions are potentially similar, potentially different from one another, and use that to define what it means for a set to be compact. So I'm not going to bury the lead. I'll just say it straight ahead. Every cover finite set is also subsequentially complete. Every subsequentially complete set is also cover finite. So these two different ideas that we had for how to avoid the local to global heartbreak are actually the same idea. Every set that does one of them also does the other. And so we cannot do one of them without doing both. So they are exactly the same notion. Every CF set is an SC set. Every SC set is a CF set. And these notions are so important and fundamental and useful and we like them so much that we attach a specific, we attach the name compact. So we call a set compact if it is either one of these. If it's cover finite, it's compact. If it's subsequentially complete, it's compact. And since those notions are the same thing, it doesn't matter which one. If, if we're either of them, then we're automatically both. So let's investigate why that might be. Right? Why should we believe that these two notions are the same notion? Let's start by taking a set which we know is a cover finite set and trying to justify why that set must be subsequentially complete. So our burden of proof here for my CF set is to show that any sequence of points in A possesses a convergent subsequence whose limit is also a point of A. So let's start with an arbitrary sequence of points in A. We proved a couple of videos ago that cover finite sets were bounded. And therefore, since my set A is by assumption cover finite, it's a bounded set. And so the sequence of points, because all my points belong to A, that sequence is a bounded sequence. And we know from one of the more important results from a couple of chapters ago in the beginning of real analysis is that every sequence of real numbers which is bounded automatically has a subsequence which is convergent. That is a super not obvious and very important result from the first half of real analysis that we're going to make really good use of here. It's called the bolzano weierstrass theorem very often when we meet it for the first time. So since we already have proven that CF sets are bounded, that means that my sequence is bounded because all of its members belong to my CF set A. 
and therefore it possesses a convergent subsequence. So we'll just imagine that these points are my subsequence. They have a limit. We're going to call that limit x. But we're not immediately done yet because we need to show not only that my sequence has a convergent subsequence, but that, moreover, the limit of that subsequence is also a point of A. So we have a little bit more work to do here. So how can we be sure that the limit of my convergent subsequence is actually a point of A? Well, let's make the contrary assumption. Right? Let's assume that the limit of my subsequence is not a point of A. Well, if it's not a point of A, then let's take a, a collection of increasingly larger epsilon balls around x, and then look at the complements of those epsilon balls. Um, and just so that we can get an open cover, let's imagine that my epsilon balls are closed epsilon balls. So we take the set of all points, which is the distance of less than or equal to epsilon away from x, and we take the complement of those, and we're going to get open sets. And so that collection of complements of closed balls of increasingly large radius around my point are going to form an open cover of my set. Just because every point in my set is going to be some distance away from x, and that some distance is going to be bigger than 0 because uh, x doesn't belong to my set, but it's also going to be smaller than some power of 2 who's going to define the radius of the complement of the epsilon ball to which this uh, point belongs. Right? So the complements of these balls are going to form an open cover for my set A. But since A has the cover finiteness property, there exists a finite subcover that does the same job. So only finitely many of these complements of closed epsilon balls around x are necessary to cover my set A. So A belongs to the union of only finitely many, J, uh, finitely many of these open complements of closed balls. And the largest one of those sets is going to contain all the other ones. And so this union is going to equal the largest one of these sets. And so there is no point of A which gets within a distance of 2 to the minus nj away from x. In other words, every single point of A is bounded away from x by at least 2 to the minus nj. But this is impossible because it means that no longer will it be the case that my subsequence of points, because all my subsequence of points belong to the set A, we can't have that subsequence converge to x because no point of A can get within a distance of 2 to the minus nj away from x. So if I pick an epsilon that's smaller than 2 to the minus nj, there is no point of my subsequence, let alone an entire infinite tail of my subsequence, which gets that close to x. And so we can't have the subsequence converge to x. Um, in that case. And so if x doesn't belong to a, then we get this contradiction. Right? Therefore, we must have that x belongs to a. And so the limit of this convergent subsequence belongs to a. So we have proven, because my sequence was arbitrarily chosen, that a is a subsequentially complete set. So if you give me a cover finite set, I've shown that that set is also subsequentially complete. What about the other direction? So how can I show that every subsequentially complete set is also cover finite? This actually turns out to be a much trickier argument to make. So I'm just going to kind of outline the high points. And if you want more of the details, um, my favorite proof of this comes out of Munkries' topology book. Uh, so feel free to pick up a copy of that if you want to see all the little details for how this shakes out. But here's the main idea. I want to prove that A, having assumed that it's subsequentially complete, is cover finite. So I start by picking an arbitrary open cover of A. And I want to show that that cover has a finite subcover that still covers the whole set A. So how would I do it? Well, the first observation, and this requires some proof, is that it is always possible to cover A, every subsequentially complete set, with a finite collection of epsilon balls. No matter how large or small we make epsilon, we can take only finitely many epsilon balls and they can cover the entirety of my set A because A is subsequentially complete. So this requires a little bit of proof. But once we establish that subsequentially complete sets can be covered with finitely many epsilon balls, no matter how small or large we make epsilon. Then the second piece of this is to relate these epsilon balls back to the open sets in my open cover for A, right? because a priori they should have nothing to do with one another. And the way that we do that is by proving a second piece. We can prove that if we choose epsilon to be small enough, then each one of these epsilon balls is going to be contained in one and only one of the members of my open cover for A. This is called the Lebesgue number lemma. Um, and it's something that, again, we need the subsequential completeness in order to justify this notion. But if we have both of these things, if we can prove both of these things, then that means if I can cover A with finitely many epsilon balls, and each one of these epsilon balls is a subset of exactly one of the members of my open cover, 
that means that that same collection of members of my open cover, which is a finite collection, can cover all of A. And therefore, we've had a finite sub. So this is how compact sets roll. I mean, what's so great about this characterization is that if I know I have a compact set, or if I want to prove that something is compact, I can use either one of these ideas in a proof. Whichever one lends itself better to my way of thinking or lends itself better to the material that we know to be true that we have to work with in our proof. When it's convenient, we can say compactness means cover finiteness, that every open cover has a finite subcover. And also when it's convenient, we can say that compactness means subsequential compactness, right? Subsequential completeness, that every sequence of points in my set has a subsequence that converges in my set. But either one of these notions always means exactly the same thing as the other, and they mean the same thing as compactness. And so what we want to do next is see if there is a better face that we can put on compact sets. Because both CF and SC are kind of hard conditions to work with. They require us to use some really sort of sophisticated machinery. But it turns out that if we're most interested in working with subsets of the real numbers or subsets of n-dimensional real Euclidean space, Rn, right, there is a much easier set of criteria for what it means for a set to be compact. And that's what we'll look at in the next video.